Greetings. My name is Will Smith, and I'm here with the mayor of Dayton, Nan Whaley. And with today, we're going to discuss the Roots of Racism series that recently aired, talk about some of the things that we learned from it, and how we um, hope that it can impact our city in the future. Thank you for joining me, Mayor. Will, thank you. Thanks for all your amazing work on this project, the Roots of Racism, kind of a labor of love for you the work you've done on police reform and the work you do at the Board of Education as a member. And then, you know, congratulations on your new baby, which is probably keeping you the busiest right now. It is. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So let's just jump right in, shall we? Sure, absolutely. With the Roots of Racism, can we just talk about how did it come about? You know, it really grew into something big, bigger than we thought it would be. But can you talk about how, you know, the seeds were planted for this? Well, yeah, for sure. And you have a lot to do with that. You know, we were talking, um, after the civil unrest that happened with the murder of George Floyd across the country, we would hear a lot about people saying, well, we don't have that problem in Dayton, or this is a national issue and not a local issue. And so I remember talking to you via Zoom, which is how we normally see each other, and saying, you know, like, look, you know, Dayton does have a history of systemic racism that is affecting all of our systems today in our community and we really can't move forward if we don't have an understanding of what it is. So we thought about doing a program in like uh, pre-COVID times we would have just probably got in the room at the library, invited everybody and they would have come in. This is a silver lining of COVID, right? So the amount of work that you and Darius from my team uh, and also the uh, Tiffany Taylor Smith and uh, uh, the other uh, professors at UD mm -hmm. like did was a lot more work but it actually helped because we put it online and thousands of people got to see it where we probably if we had done it the old school way a hundred people that already knew most of this would have come pat themselves on the back to move forward so uh, I'm really excited about the format because it's something that we can keep and we can use for future um, future conversations uh, it's, it's itself a piece of historic relevance, and relevance now for our community, and I think we reached a lot more people than we would have if we had just done it the old-fashioned way. Yeah, I think so. I think that was the, the surprising thing to me is the way it grew. You know, we really thought and how we could sit there, and I remember talking with Dr. Pika, who was one of the other people from UD that helped us with this, and we just kind of looked and said, whoa, now we're going to have to separate this into three, three sections. Right and you know how many people got uh, involved in bringing you know the library and uh, Premier Health and so many people got involved and so I really think that just seeing how in the midst of COVID that you know not being together made us have to kind of think of a bigger way and a bigger reach so no I agree and I think what was funny I mean you know I always feel like we could do something in a month and you know it took a lot more time because of the the preparation that the presenters like you and Dr. Pika had to had to do mm -hmm. but such a powerful program these three these three sections and I I learned a lot uh, from them myself so I think they were they were just really well done I have to tell you I told Darius uh, Beckham who uh, works at, at City Hall with us uh, you know I talked uh, to the UD College men, men's and women's basketball team and Coach Grant said he and his wife even watched them. So I said mm -hmm. to Darius, like, we really are, you know, everybody is really uh, taking this on and been very complimentary about the amazing work you all did on the, pro the project. That's great. When we talk, uh, when we talk about the, the programs, can you tell me what was the most surprising thing you may have learned from, from watching everything? I think the, the second section was the part that really, you know, grabbed me by the biggest aha moment. And, it, you know, it's something you know, but when it is laid out, like Dr. Pika does, about how these systems were put in place legally and in that period of time considered appropriate to really segregate our community and to create two classes and two systems. And, you know, that wasn't that long ago, really. You know, mm -hmm. my parents were alive during that period, so it's just a generation before me. Um, that, that I think really hit home and it also really brought home how hard this work is to untangle all of that, right? That this isn't something that can just be done by like one person's awakening. It takes work um, for a system that was so thoughtfully done to, to uh, be racist and to segregate how to get that undone is going to take probably much longer. And I think that was, I think, a very powerful, uh, a powerful point I thought that she made. It was, especially I think when when she really tied in what was going on 
with some of the most famous Daytonians that we have in our history right. to realize that these things happened along the same times. And, and I think that's what really sunk in with me watching that part. It was really, you know, interesting and, you know, at times disheartening, but then it's, it's real. It, it really happened. So what would you say is the importance of the series today? You know, why should we dive into the roots of racism here in our own hometown? Well, I think if we don't know our history, we can't really change our future. And I think that's what's so important about, about this. And really looking at history through the, ish, the, the lens of race is something that we just don't do. It, uh, it has a tendency to be glossed over. It's, we idealize uh, our, our past leaders. Uh, we don't tell the full story. Uh, so, so having that lens, I think, gives, allows us to have a little bit of grace in trying to move forward, recognizing what the work we're going to do. And then a real understanding that, like, this is uncomfortable, this is um, a hard work, and, you know, some of us, like me, benefit, frankly, from, from what has happened in the history, and many people in our community don't. And so getting that right, uh, I don't think you can do it if you don't understand where the community's been. I think that was looking at the comments during the the airing of each section and just seeing the people that went, you know, I didn't know this happened. Right. Or people that reached out and said, you know, I wish they could, you know, teach this in schools or I wish more people knew. Just seeing that that a lot of people don't know. Well, and I, I hope I hope we're able to take, I mean, that's one of the things that's nice about the three segments is we have the opportunity to continue to educate people, right? Exactly. Like, so it's not something that it's there. So we're hoping that, you know, uh, history teachers across Dayton, not just in the city of Dayton, but across exactly. the region use this. Uh, you know, I think the recognition, something I knew, of course, where like the s suburbs were a lot of them created for race reasons. Um, you know, owning that is really important and doesn't mean um, that you're not trying to write it now. Like that's that's what we have to do. But um, you have to understand where you came where you came from too. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that was huge to me, is seeing how this is. We're talking about Dayton, but if we dive into Dayton, it becomes a regional story. Absolutely. Because you know, our, like you said, our suburbs were built from people that left Dayton. Right. And seeing that, and really saying, hey, we're not trying to you know point the finger at you. Right. But we're saying, yes, you do benefit from some of these things, and this is how things moved. And you know, there was um, a gentleman who who reached out and he said, you know, I never knew why I wasn't allowed to go back to my parents' old neighborhood. You know, he lived in, his parents grew up in West Dayton. He was a kid in West Dayton, about two or three or four years old, and he said they moved out to Kettering. Mm. And he said he would want to go back. He said, no, that's, that's not a good part of town. We shouldn't go there. And so, you know, he grew up thinking West Dayton was a dangerous place. Was the, I shouldn't be there. I shouldn't go. Over. And just seeing that those kind of things where he could see, okay, this is what moved. This is what transpired. So I think that's important. And I guess along those same lines, how do you feel this series resonates with, you know, different cultures and populations and demographics? Well, I, I think, you know, for some people it made folks uncomfortable. And I think that was part of our goal, right, is we wanted to make some, some people uncomfortable. Um, that, I think, is how we can get some change. And you have to decide if you're okay with that uncomfort and you just want to cover it up or if you want to really go at, at, at really breaking down these systems. So I think for some folks that's, that's what's happened. I think for a lot, like people just had no idea, right? And I think probably the vast majority of our community uh, has really no sense. Unless, unless you're black and you were raised in Dayton or uh, you're older, you know, over, over 50, I think you really don't have a sense of this. And what, what I've learned in this movement is, you know, especially it's very exciting to have so many young people uh, engaged in this work, right? But their history is the entire time of their life, which is a hot 20 years or 25, 30 years. And so really helping young people have a sense of where we've been and why these systems are so messed up, I think can help them really do the work to, to change the systems. And that's what we're counting on. So I think, I think a lot of it is just people being completely unaware or sugarcoating uh, the sugarcoating idea of Dayton not having a problem, which we we do. I mean, for me, I, you know, I live in what is you know considered now West Dayton, and um, 
I remember when I first ran for commission, you know, people were very surprised by that. It's, I mean, I've never really lived anywhere else. I think I lived a year over in Huffman, and then, you know, I've now been at 20 years in Five Oaks, you know. Um, and so, you know, it's a pretty diverse neighborhood, and, you know, it has, it has an interesting history, but because it's the west side of the river, it is West Dayton. And so I think that kind of understanding, and I think your section really talked about that, that this mm -hmm. pejorative nature of West Dayton instead of the richness of a lot of the neighborhoods in West, I think is uh, really important to this discussion too. Yeah, I definitely think that that you hit the nail on the head when you said that it, a lot of people had that uncomfortable feeling. Mm -hmm. And that, that is what, you know, you have to go for. I believe if you're going to talk about racism, it can't be a happy discussion. No. It has to be real and talk about some things that might, you know, hit you in the face at times. Right. And I think that was the, um, the, the greatness of having so much imagery in there. You know, people could see that. And, you know, for some demographics, like you said, they're looking and saying, I remember that happening to me. Other people are looking and going, oh, my gosh, that happened? And then other people are, you know, still kind of like, oh, turn, turn, I don't want to see this. I don't want to hear it, right? Because it makes I, me uncomfortable, yeah, right? And I think if you're going to get involved, and I think especially when we look at the national scope and the local scope of how things are moving, and, you know, even with some of the reform work we are talking about doing, you have to have that uncomfortable feeling first. Mm -hmm. And I think just seeing people have that in real time was was really really moving to me to say you know what it's sticking with some people that's good i agree so how do the issues to you that were raised in the series how do they affect the work that needs to be done today well i think when i see the series especially the third part that that you were a part of a lot of it is repeating itself a bit, right? We're maybe a little further along, but still fighting some of the same issues that Leela Francis fought and uh, Don Cofford and James McGee fought, right? Uh, uh, you know, I thought you guys did a great job too. These are names and people that were pretty, not very long ago and names that are storied at City Hall, but to see um, how they had to fight City Hall to really get those changes, I think uh, really, uh, is, is pretty is pretty powerful. You know, our hope at City Hall now with, you know, a real change, you know, until a few years ago, we had a majority African-American city commission, you know, um, is probably one of the more diverse um, organizations as far as leadership in the entire region. You know, we really are trying to lean into that and how we can really help move that along and be the voice for, uh, for the, in the region, how the city can really drive that in other conversations you know of, of course doing this work in police reform inside our house is really important but you know really driving that across different organizations as well i think is really key and, I, and i'm proud of of what mcgee and um and crawford and lovelace have done during that period because i think their their um their mentality is still like in the in the bones of city hall that's our history too right mm -hmm. and so I think, you know, watching the third part really reminded me that this is the work that we continue to do, the work that we continue to strive on. Uh, you know, it's why, it's why we do the work in police reform. It's the reason why we fight against Stand Your Ground. It's the reason why we work so closely with the Fair Housing Center. You know, all of these, you know, working in the education system to make sure that uh, kids of color have as much access as white kids in Oakwood. You know, these are the, the work that we are constantly doing. And it is hard and it is difficult and we lose a lot. Uh, and you have to be okay if you're going to break up systems. You have to be okay with losing a bit to, to, keep, to keep making change. You know, I think as an organizer, that's one of the things that I learned early is that, you know, you fight and even when you win, then you have to fight to hold on to that win. Right. And then understand that somebody else might take that win. And I think that was a big piece. And even just doing that third part is seeing some of the, when we dove in, which is one of the things that I, I loved about the media we had back then, even though things weren't all great. Just the fact that so many things were documented that we can go back and look yeah. at it now and go, wow, this this actually was put down, which also showed how how normalized it was to people. Right. That the we could talk news, about these the things. Right, and right. it was there and just seeing like, you know, people saying, you know, city, the services they wanted and, you know, the housing disparities and seeing how, you know, white flight happened when schools were integrated and seeing how West Dayton grew from a pocket to being everything on that side of the river and just 
and seeing how these things have just carried on. And then you look and you say, okay, this is why so much has to be done. Right. Because so much is, is laid on top of it, you know. I think that's, that is a big piece. And I appreciate the work. You know, I appreciate the work that a lot of people are doing around the city. I appreciate the people that were activated this summer. And I just, I, I want to see them keep going. Right. Because, you know, it, it, it definitely needs to, to be continued. Because like you said in the series, it's, it, even Kelly's part was before, before the 1900s and seeing that these things were put in place where people said, okay, there's going to be haves, there's going to be have-nots. And as we continue to have the have-nots, their hole is going to get deeper. Right. And so even when there's a little bit of moving forward, it's like, okay, you move forward because I moved further ahead and I right. let you have that. Right. So I think that, that is a, uh, a good thing to note that all of that is why there's so much work that needs to be done. Um, what is your biggest takeaway or even a couple of big takeaways from, from this work, uh, from the series and moving forward? Well, I think, I think that, uh, what the series shows is Dayton's, you know, uh, the Europeans came to Dayton in what the late 1600s, early 1700s and settled and, uh, kicked Native Americans off the, off their land, which they did across this whole country. You know, mm -hmm. it's probably one of our, you know, key sins along with slavery. So we partake, part, you know, we're part of that. But I think, I think the thing is that is so, you know, that's 300 years ago. That's a long time um, in American, you know, history, right? So 300 years ago is almost the entire time of like when they started covering um, European history uh, in America. And so I think the, the story is, is we have lots of work to do that it is part of the continuum of the work that we are a part of. And, um, you know, I think, well, one of your great assets is, you know, as an organizer is you are always comfortable with making the steps. It is never perfect. It is never perfect. We are moving in a direction to be better. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's what you have to get comfortable with when you're doing this kind of work is, um, you know, we are standing on an original sin here. And so, you know, continuing to make lives better, to make it fairer can, and continue to make that more fair is the work that we're doing. Uh, you know, as someone that's an elected official, it has, I have a tendency to be impatient in this work. And you've got to have some patience because mm -hmm. you're bringing people along that are having awakenings at different times um, than you are or, you know, don't have your lived experience. And so I think that's what I've been most amazed by watching you through this work is just the sheer amount of patience you have with everyone to get everybody to move forward. And I think that's what we have to remember is, uh, you know, we are going to always have these roots. These, 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 uh, you cannot change what has happened to black people in our community. Um, but you can change what happens to black people in our community in the future. And that is really what this works about. And so I think that's my big takeaway from it. Um, and I, I am hopeful that people that, you know, maybe didn't watch it or aren't the usual suspects in this work, see it and maybe it makes them think a little more about their community or the system that they're a part of and and inspires them to make changes or not think that they can't do anything. Because mm -hmm. uh, we can all do something in, in systems uh, to make change or to be the voice of something that's not fair. Uh, and I think that's, that's the hard work that we continue to, to work on today. I agree. I think that was uh, a great a great way to talk about how I feel about this. You know, I really do feel that we can't move forward unless we actually acknowledge and then try to, you know, untangle some of the knots that were created uh, because of right. it. And I think the biggest thing when I went back and because, you know, I watched it as if I didn't have a part in it because it was it was so interesting to see it all put play sure. together. And, you know, the people here at DATV did a wonderful job with it, you know. Dale became my best friend for a while. Yeah, Dale's awesome. And just seeing how it resonated with my upbringing. And, you know, I, I started thinking, you know, when I was growing up, I had friends who lived on Germantown, and I lived off Salem Avenue, and they would say, you don't live in West Dayton. Right. You know, like their grandparents would go, that's Northwest Dayton. And just seeing how, you know, when I grew up, there were still, I came up in a weird time of the, the 80s where, you know, people had left, but the things were there. We still had like a red lobster on Salem. There was all these things like right there. I remember, yeah. And so just seeing how growing up, I thought, you know, wow, what's going on? 
why are these things leaving or why is this why is this happening and and then getting older and seeing okay that was built when I wasn't there you know I didn't live in these neighborhoods or you know I I grew up on like I said on Salem and seeing how like there were three synagogues and in my mind as a young kid I'm like I don't know what that means but when you get older you say that was a population shift mm -hmm. and just seeing how all of these things play together and and I think that was the, the, the biggest thing to me, is seeing how I'm glad that we put it out in a larger area so more eyes got on it. Because usually when you talk about racism, it's the people who suffered from racism. That's the audience. And I think that's where we have to move away from. Because, you know, we can't, you can't tell me about racism all day. And I'm, it's, it's going to make people go, well, what are you going to do about it? Right. Or, you know, I live that. I know that story. So I think that was the biggest thing is just showing it and seeing so many faces who were like, hey, I never. And that showed you, like you said, we have it's the patience when you show something like this and you have somebody go, I never knew that happened. And I lived in Dayton for 65 years. Right. And you're like, how did you not? Know it? But that's life. And I think it shows, like you said, people are in their own lives and they're in their bubbles. Yep. And uh, I think that's what we're trying to do is break bubbles here. Right. So we, mm -hmm. even during COVID, when we tell everybody to stay in their bubble, you know, <laughs> we're trying to break some bubbles. And I think uh, I, I really did enjoy, too, the elders conversation. Oh, you know, yes. They were I thought, great. I thought they were great. Mary Tyler and Bing Davis and Doc Seidel and Renita Hall Sanders. I mean, they just did a great job of sharing their perspective. So I thought that was a uh, a great part of like contemporary history that we yes. really saw and like you know um, we still run into this redlining uh, that gets legal you know I, yep. I when I first became a city commissioner we fought um, hard and lost you know losing is part of this we fought hard and lost to stop you know AT&T verse to choose which neighborhoods it wanted to do based on income you know mm -hmm. again when when decisions are made based on income that is just race light. Yep. It is just all it is. And so, you know, you see the city fighting that, fighting the foreclosure crisis, fighting payday mm -hmm. lending. These fights will continue on. Yep. Uh, and there are there are capitalist efforts underway to to really push that. And that, and we see that we see that in the Dollar General stores. You know, over and over again, race and income are linked because of the systems in place to make sure that Black people didn't make as much as whites. Yep. That's what's going on. It continues to go on, and it's continuing to be a fight for us um, at City Hall and across the state and across the country. And I think that is, I'm so glad you brought that up for people to understand that once you were able to keep blacks at a certain level, you could then move the racism or the racism, racist overtones out. Out, right. You didn't have to say we don't want blacks. It's just we just don't want poor people. Right. Because now you know, okay, you're most likely going to be in that bucket anyway. So now we don't even have to say black anymore. Right. And so I think that was, that is a, a real thing. And I think a lot of people have to understand it's continual fights. Like what happened to George Floyd has happened over time in history. Right. Time and time again. And I think where, where we get is where we have to say, okay, these are the, the works, the steps that we have to do. And so I'm glad that this really highlighted a lot of that and really highlights a lot of the things that we're doing as a city. At the school level, um, you know, downtown at City Hall, there's a lot of work to be done. So. Ne never, never uh, short of work. So I'm really glad no, you're in the <laughs> in the fight and care about this community. Well, we're really it's lucky always to have work you here. to do. So I'm glad you were able to join me here today. Do you have any closing comments? No, I'm just I'm super grateful for great leaders that we see coming up, like yourself and others. I think uh, the movement this summer has shown some of that, and look forward to that growth continuing to happen to help our community. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the police reform efforts, being that in part three, one of the things that was raised was, you know, after the riots, there were um, a lot of people wanting change within the police um, here in Dayton. And I think that what we're doing now is different because of even the makeup of the people that are in the room. You know, back then it was, it was high level folk. It wasn't reflective of the community. So can you talk about how, you know, the Roots of Racism, that series also reflects with some of the police reform work we're doing in Dayton? For sure. You know, I think one of the things that is culturally the basis of Dayton is, you know, even the way the commission was formed uh, after the 1914 flood was really about the business community controlling Dayton. And we didn't talk about this in the, in the Roots of Racism. It does have a big effect in Dayton's history and how we work today. You know, we have, we have uh, four, 
four commissioners and a mayor. That was exactly like Jim uh, Patterson's board at National Cash Register. And then at the beginning in the 1900s, uh, each business would like donate a CEO, a chief executive, not necessarily the head of the organization, but one of the people in their C-suite to serve on the Dayton City Commission. And so you can kind of see uh, in the history of Dayton that Dayton was a little slow in having African-American leaders and having women leaders in, uh, in their, um, even in their council or commission because of this system. So after the, um, the 1960 riots, it was all about controlling that, controlling the conversation, the business community controlling it. You know, that, that was one of the ways that Dayton really, in its form of government, wanted to take away, as, wanted to be as little as democratic less as possible, right? So fast forward through the riots, through the changes that McGee made and Dixon made, through this process, and you see a much more inclusive um, effort at City Hall with the City Commission. Even though we have that system, you know, it's much more small d democratic, like with Commissioner Lovelace, too. So when, when, the, when the police reform efforts happened this time, we knew it was really important that it wasn't just the five commissioners making these decisions because we wanted to have the community have input. And so what you see is, and like real input, not like, you know, something baked, hey, look at this report, do you like it? Oh yes, I like it. No, like be a part of the work. So we took folks that, you know, had protested, people that were interested in this work. I think the public defenders have been really key in this. Mm -hmm. They called and said, hey, we have a lot to say about police, uh, police efforts and police reform and put together these, these committees that are super diverse uh, in not just in race, but in experience. And those conversations and what's driving the decisions, you know, led, co-led by a city commissioner and a community leader, uh, really the recommendations have bubbled up from these conversations. So it wasn't like Commissioner Mim said, I have an idea on use of force. It was, well, let's talk about the state of the uh, use of force in our police organization, what are other communities doing, we all learn together, and here are some recommendations moving forward. I think that's really, really important as we're looking across other cities who have done it different ways. You know, we pretty much decided to do this in June as a legitimate way to really engage community. Um, you know, what I've found, you know, you're in the work, Will, right? We're doing it every day, so you just keep your head down and keep moving. But what I found is, you know, other communities are now asking us, like, how did you do this? Why did you, you know, this is a really good program. And I think the key is, is to be transparent and to be inclusive. And that's what we tried to do. Now, we're not doing inclusivity for inclusivity's sake, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of times when you do that, then nobody gets a voice at all. So we really tried to be thoughtful about you know having it you know open committees but not so open that nobody gets to say anything so that that was the work that i'm really really proud of on this police reform work and how it is coming out pretty well you know we have over 40 recommendations in my committee we see people um, make recommendations and their name is next to it right like this is you know so and so's mm -hmm. recommendation and then they say yeah i really like this this is mine and then the committee decides if they're going to move it to the commission so um, I think, it, you know, you know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. And I think this was just, you know, let's try it this way. This was a brand new way for us to really look at how we were going to do community engagement on police reform. And I think um, we'll see this done in different ways, in different, uh, different efforts in the city because it is going so very well. Yeah, I think that that was a big thing for me is when we came on with the police reform work is and then seeing what was going on, you know, here in the 60s and 70s, just saying, okay, History is kind of repeating itself at that level of we want change. So how do we make sure we're not doing what they did then? Right. Which was, you know, have the same people in the room without that real community input. And I think that that is what I like. And just to, to highlight that is, you know, it took some time in the, the working groups now to say, hey, you know, you can recommend this. And I think that was that kind of highlighted where a lot of people that have come from the organizing world their mind is set that, you know, they're going to hit this wall. Right. That I'm allowed to kind of share how I feel. I can say that I'm ticked off. But very, very rarely do I get to be the one that says, this is what I want to see changed, and then have somebody go, okay, let's, let's figure out how to make it happen. Right. And so I think that that is the, the big difference for me in this, this work. And then just seeing how it affects everybody's life. It affects our everyday Daytonians. So it should be the everyday Daytonians in the room. 
Well, and it's called public safety. So public is just a key part of it. So, you know, this engagement with the public is really, really important. And I think what we're seeing across the country, and so of course we're seeing this in Dayton, is people want to be policed differently. And so it is the responsibility of police to hear and then, uh, you know, accordance. Like they, they are basically, um, that's, what, that's how it works, you know, it is, is that what the community wants is what the community gets. And, um, and I mean as a whole, right? So this is a, right. that's why it's such a holistic conversation. Um, but um, I think the other thing that's been really um, helpful in the police reform discussions is how uh, open the police officers that have been in the conversations have been like, hey, can you, can you look at this? What about this? So I've been really um, impressed by that too, that they, they have brought forward ideas that, you know, like on discipline in my group, you know, uh, Sergeant Hayob, brought forth an idea that is completely upside down around discipline, completely changing it, wanting us to look at it. Uh, so I think that that is also something that I think people didn't really anticipate. And I think that's part of this too, is you know building the relationships. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, not to say that there haven't been difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, there have been. <laughs> oh, yes, Those are right. necessary. The uncomfortableness is important to get the work done but also seeing that people, even the police department and the people in the police department say, oh, this is where we can get change too. And we kind of yes. want some change as well. So I think that's all very exciting. You know, I think I sit in the back sometimes and you know, when it gets uncomfortable, people kind of cringe and in my head, I'm like, yes, right, right. this is where we need to go to get something moving. Right. And so I think we've done a good job with that. And hopefully we can continue to move forward and make some great changes to make Dayton, uh, you know, an even better city for right. our residents. Hopefully so. I appreciate you. Thanks for having uh, this conversation with me today. Thanks for tuning in with us. I hope you all have gotten a chance to watch The Roots of Racism. If not, you can find it at DATV as well as Dayton Daily News' Facebook page. You can just search Roots of Racism. Please check it out uh, and share with a friend. This is a discussion that has to move on because the work has to move on. Once again, I'm Will Smith with our Dayton Mayor, Nan Whaley. I appreciate you all. Take care.